Welcome to the podcast. We're street smart, business smart, all kinds of smart people share their insights into the world of marketing, career journeys, and personal growth. So sit back and prepare to get enlightened with your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the podcast where I bring you the best and brightest from the world of business, marketing, and personal growth to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your career forward. Tribe, I am super excited to welcome my guest today, Oleg Lohid. Good chance you do not know him, but after today, you will feel like you've known him your entire life. And his start in life was, uh, was, was a tough one. At nine years old, he was in, in, in the former Soviet Union, was it still the former Soviet Union back then, or you're not that old? Uh, transition and yeah, yeah transition a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at nine years old, he relinquished his parents' rights and entered the Russian orphanage. Yikes! And at twelve, he decided to be adopted into a new family in a new country, halfway across the world, and start a new life. And at twenty-four, he began his journey of helping others live the life they have always dreamed of, despite of their hardships and misfortunes, by allowing them to recognize their own uniqueness and worth within their own story. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. Can't wait to share this dude's story. And uh, him and I connected at the end of last year, 2019, and had a tremendous conversation. And I could sense that his energy and authenticity immediately, I knew it, that we were on the same wavelength, Mm -hmm. and I knew that we had a connection. And Oleg was kind enough to welcome me on his show, Overcoming Odds podcast, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And he really got me to open up and be vulnerable uh, and share my story. And uh, we're here to return the favor. Oleg, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on, man. No, thank you for having me here. And thank you for the different connections and the opportunity to really just learn about who you are and the different things that have become a part of that journey to begin with. Yeah, it's awesome. I really love how our journeys have been inter, interwoven, interweaving, mm-hmm. how they're interwhite weaving at the same time here. It's pretty awesome. But enough mm-hmm. about me. Let's start off quickly and introduce yourself to my tribe. What did I miss in that intro? I think your story, let's hear it from you, man. Let's mm-hmm. tell my tribe your story, man. You know, I think for me, in, in a quick version of what my story is, so I was born in a foreign country as you might be able to tell by the name. I was born in Russia. And for my first 12 years of my life, did not have the traditional upbringing as far as having a household and a family to really depend on. So as part of that journey, what I had to figure out was how do I make it through the day-to-day situations? And what I'm beginning to understand now is, is because I was essentially forced to become an adult from the ages of four to five to maybe even six years old, I essentially gave up my childhood. So I, I don't really know what it was like to be a child. I can tell you what it was like to be an adult-like minded individual, someone who had to find places to sleep, food to eat. And as part of that, what I realized, and one of the things that you mentioned was when I was nine years old, I had hit a moment within my life where, and I'm sure some of the listeners might be able to relate, there's a moment where you hit where enough is enough. And that moment was for me at nine. And even though it took a difficult turn and difficult decision to make it a reality, and that is to give up my parents' rights to go into that new space and new opportunity. But I knew it was something that had to be done because I just sensed that by going into that particular system, that there was some hope, that there was some opportunity that can help me get to the other side. And so ultimately I was adopted through that orphanage system at the age of 12 ended up coming here to Ann Arbor, Michigan in 2005, spoke zero words of English, knew very little about this part of the world besides the the name Michael Jordan, true story. And I couldn't even tell you what a basketball looked like. So my journey began from those roots and the hardships. But at the same time, what I'll tell you now is that it is because of those hardships, it is because of those circumstances, it is because of all the people that have been within my life that I am the individual today because I choose to look at it differently. I choose to look at every one of the events as opportunities for me to learn, to grow, and to better embrace myself for the person that I am today. And so for me, there is really no concept as good or bad. There just is. It happens to you and you you really have to put yourself in a position where you can look at yourself and say, well, what are the takeaways? What are the mm-hmm. lessons that I can learn? And so that's what my journey was like from that very young age. And, and it ultimately prepared me to step into the space where I can share my story 
and understand that my story is not for me. My story is for other people to share their stories. It's an entry point. It's a doorway to something that's oftentimes we think is not possible. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome, man. So it's, it's a, you know, it's an incredible journey to be on. And as I'm sure you've experienced throughout your own life, being able to share your story, it takes a lot of courage. Um, It takes a lot of perseverance to do so. But I'll tell you that once I started to do it, I just felt that I became more connected to who I was and the connections that I had with other people just became that much more meaningful for me. It's incredible talking about vulnerability, right? Like Mm -hmm. once everybody has different, different, you know, thresholds of how vulnerable they want to be and especially around certain people, right? And Mm -hmm. not everyone is open to it. And I think one of the things that you and I have in common is that we both recognize that once we were able to be publicly vulnerable about certain aspects of our story in life, it just opened up the door to so many other opportunities and conversations. Mm -hmm. And it really was letting the light and energy in and being able to manifest it and turning it into something positive. But I want to go back. Um, Mm -hmm. If if you don't mind me asking, and and please tell me if if you don't want to talk about it, but I mean, I talking about like, you know, and nine years old, right. And we don't need to get into details, but like, what was going through your head at nine when you're like, I needed to get out of this situation. And, you know, we're talking about transitioning Soviet Union, Russia back then, like that Mm -hmm. was not the United States, you know, not the same place, a much different place, but like, let's, let's take it back to that if you don't mind. And like, Mm -hmm. what was going through your mindset when you were like, I need to make a change and get out of this situation at nine? Yeah. You know, I think for me, the, the difference was that the history and the transition that the country was going through, it didn't really impact me because of the fact that I was so young. What impacted me ultimately were the events that I had faced within my household. So one of the biggest memories that I actually have a challenge of working through at this particular time and moment is a memory of when my sister almost took away my mom's life. So I was was young and I was at her apartment and there was a, a fight broke out in the kitchen between my sister and my mom. And ultimately what I believe it was about was the fact that my mom continued to drink when she said she would stop. And so it was a very difficult position for my sister to be in. And I don't blame her for any of the decisions that I made. I don't blame any of the people, but it's difficult for me to recognize how someone in that position could put themselves where they're almost taking a family member's life away. That's insane. And so it was moments like that where I really started to look at my whole journey and I started to understand that, you know, I've, I've lived through so much and I've seen so much and I just need a change. And that opportunity in that window was available through the life at the orphanage. There was nothing else that I was introduced to as far as what's possible and what can help me shift this perspective. So they didn't stop you? Your parents didn't stop you from, from leaving, going to the orphanage? My, my, my sister, so because she was my legal guardian at the time, she ended up coming with me to, I believe it was city council or city hall at the time. And we went in there and I remember this vividly. I sat on one side of the table and this woman in charge of the orphanage placements sat on the other. And she had shared with me the whole orphanage setting, how you'll have toys to play with, friends, food on your, t- on your table, roof over your head, honestly, everything that I needed to hear at that particular time. So a part of me, without a doubt, I think I was sold on that. All right. But then the other part, I just knew that I had to do that. Now, here's another thing. Because, the, because of the fact that I was nine, I don't know if I fully understood what it would be like to give up your family. Because what I potentially might have thought of was that I'm giving up my family to go live into to go live at this orphanage, but I'll probably still have the same opportunities to see them whenever I want. But the thing is, that wasn't true. When I went into the orphanage, not only did they have visitation hours for X, Y, and Z periods of the day, but you actually had no time and opportunities to go see them on your own. So it's not like I could leave, go see my mom or my sister and talk to them. Whenever I did that, and I tried that a couple of times while living there, I got in trouble. And as part of it, I was made an example in front of some of the older orphans where I was brought up. I was that kid that was brought up in the middle of family room and beat by some of the older orphans to make you an example 
for other people of what not to do. That's crazy, man. So let's fast forward. Uh, mm -hmm. How long were you in the orphanage before you got adopted? You were 14, I believe? Three, three years. I was three years, nine to 12. And then my first visit to the States, I believe it was at 11 years old had for to, a two-week stay. Had that a, worked, um, the, the orphanage, or there was an organization that, that brought you over to meet American families? Yeah, there was an adoption agency in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that had essentially put together a program I guess you could call it equivalent to an exchange program. Right. We were able to come here for two weeks, two to three weeks, and we actually performed folk songs. True story. Russian folk songs? Russian folk songs at some of the M churches. Little Masha, Misha. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So we did that. Ka Kalabok? Did, did, did you remember the story of Kalabok? Yeah. <laughs> my, my, I do. My, my morning, it's a crazy story. I mean, I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but essentially it's a loaf of bread. <laughs> little baby loaf of bread that escapes and then the wolf is, is trying to chase it and eat it. And the, yeah. the bread is like talking to the frog and the, the toad and, and they're all telling this little loaf of bread to go hide and everything. Mm -hmm. And then it fucking ends in an awful way and the, the <laughs> loaf of bread gets eaten by the wolf. And my kids love this story. They grew up with it. I mean, I'm telling you, Oleg, I mean, I'll FaceTime you one day when my kid is watching this. They are immersed uh -huh. in, in the story of Call of Bulk. Anyway, I went off yeah. on a tangent there. So now it's, we're back to folks. That's, how we're, <laughs> that's why we connect, man, because you know about Call of Bulk. Exactly. And that's, you know, and that's what it was for me is performing those folk songs at the churches, which were packed with future adoptive parents. And then for the two weeks, we ended up staying with what our, what would be our, our adoptive parents. Right, so it was like a foster type in the beginning. Exactly. Like right. an exchange program. And mind you this, I didn't speak any English. I knew literally nothing true, true. about this part of the world. And so the only way that my parents and I actually communicated was through Google Translate and Paper Dictionary. Now, here's the thing that I always explain to people. At that age, I'm actually learning two languages. I'm learning the language of a teenager and I'm learning the language, I'm learning English. So both of those were challenging to do so because there were so many obstacles that I had to overcome. And in addition, you have to figure out how do you make friends? How do you even kind of form? Yeah, exactly. How do you form this family dynamic that you have? How do you accept your new parents for their roles while knowing the fact that you actually have another family in another country? Were your parents very religious? Is your current family very religious? No, no, they are not. So it went through the church, but it wasn't a uh, like a religious pilgrimage or any type of... Correct. I think it was... The reason why I went through the church is because... Well, I could be speculating here, but... The um, typically, I think churches are very open to providing space right. for any events like that, especially when it has to do with orphans and families and doing mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. So, so let me let me ask you this, right? Um, what was that first interaction with your new family? I mean, I'm sure there was trepidation on your side; you mm -hmm. were scared, but like, was was that connection immediate? Was that that love, that connection there? How did that develop? You know, I think. That's a really good question. So at first, I think the connection was immediate as far as the love and the support. The other part of the connection I had to step into. So what I mean by mm -hmm. that is I actually chose to call them mom and dad from the very first week in order to avoid any sort of awkward moments moving forward. So at the because, age of 14, you had that foresight, you had that, that mental fortitude and mm -hmm. foresight to, to, to say, I am going to take that positive action to call my new parents, mom and dad, mm -hmm. to take away, to make it smoother. That's incredible, dude. Yeah, yeah. I, had to, I, I realized that that was one of the things I had to do. Just basically, I don't know how I recognized it, but I just noticed that when you called people by their first name or last name, especially when it's your family members, there's some sort of tension that ends up happening. And so for me, I just said, I'm, I'm just going to avoid that completely. And I'm going to start calling them for it. Now, as part of that, there, was, um, there were a couple of moments that I battled with. And that is, I didn't know if by calling them mom and dad, that I was actually being disrespectful to my birth family, that I was taking away a title from them and giving it to my adoptive parents that I didn't necessarily know as well at the time. It's interesting. The difference between someone being a biological parent and actually mm -hmm. being a mother or father. 
Mm -hmm. right there's a there's a difference between being called mom and dad and being a birth father or birth mother right like yeah anyone anyone could be a father anyone could be any man could be a father but a real man's a dad right like being a true dad being there in that supportive and nurturing role and i think that's what the difference is man yeah and i mean even think about it this way so when you call someone an adoptive dad and if i call you a father there's a big difference there are questions that automatically come with one and not the other. And I think as part of that, I'm sure that's one of the things that people have a challenge accepting and really just embracing as part of their identity. Because when I call, when I would introduce my parents as adoptive parents, all of a sudden I would get questions, what happened? By putting Where, the adoptive in front of it. Exactly. Where are your real parents? Yeah, it's a whole story. And so, exactly. So you have to be able to tell that story. And oftentimes, you haven't even told that story to yourself. So how can you tell the story to another person? That's that's an interesting point there, right? Like, what is that story that you tell yourself before you could tell anybody? And I think that really translates into that me- into the message mm-hmm. that you're putting across now. And you talk a lot about quote the power of a story. Yeah. Right. And let's talk about that little journey too, a little big journey about how you harness your vulnerability, you've crafted your internal story, and how you teach others now to talk about the power of their own stories. Mm -hmm. So for me, what started to click a couple years ago was that it was something that once again, you and I connect over. I was listening to different podcasts and I was getting introduced to different coursework and entrepreneurs. And the biggest trend that I noticed was that everyone was trying to sell me something. Everyone was trying to sell me that next course or, or the five steps to become a seven figure earner. Right. And I just, I just questioned that. I said, well, what if I there. don't want, what if I don't want that? What if I just want to figure out who I really am? What if I just want to dig deeper? I don't want a course. And that's where I began to notice that this whole concept of a story, it's available to us at any given time. Usually for free. Exactly. And, and we have a choice in whether rewriting that story, starting from where we are, and also understanding that the story that we're living now is not the final chapter. And so when I begin to understand that and really dive into it, there were a lot of elements that stood out to me that were a little bit challenging at first to really process. And one of the biggest ones that I noticed as a challenge was embracing myself for everything. What do you mean by that? So when I was in, when I was in middle school, when I came in here, I was in sixth grade and it's like, it's funny because I went back to my middle school recently and I shared the story with some of my teachers. I was in sixth grade and I just happened to pair up or one of my first friends also happened to be one of the biggest troublemakers in the school. Usually the way it works. Didn't, didn't follow rules, you know, mm. made up his own rules. <laughs> right. And so because of the background that I was in, which was barely speaking any, any English and literally looking for a place to belong and be accepted, I was, in, I was part of his tribe. And so I thought that the behavior that, or the way that he was behaving was the quote unquote correct way to do so. Right. So I thought that it was okay to make fun of other kids or to be the class clown and get kicked out of classrooms and get sent to the principal's office. And so for the longest time, I didn't really understand what was wrong with my behavior. And so as part of it, what I began to notice was that that type of behavior is just not acceptable. And no. so it actually impacted me to a, in a way where I started to look at myself as a bad human being. And I started to look at it from the point of view as like, wow, I suck. I, I, I'm acting this way. My parents are disappointed. I'm constantly in the principal's office. What's wrong with me? And, that, and that's where one of the, I guess, first you know, definitions or realizations that came for me, the whole concept of good and bad. And so I started to avoid those circumstances. And I would look at people differently even when I thought people were acting bad, I would look at them differently. I would judge them. I'll compare them. But then what I began to notice was that the whole point of life, in my opinion, it's not to just categorize yourself into good and bad, but rather just embrace the whole thing. So when I started to look at the whole journey and all the years throughout middle school and high school, when I behaved that way, 
I just started to tell myself that that's the way it had to be in order for me to get aligned on this path. And sure, if I knew any better, if I had any other information available to me, yes, I might've acted different, but I didn't. And so part of it, I think is just recognizing it and also living with that truth. Yeah, that's, that's heavy shit, man. Right. So what was it? Was there like that aha moment? Like when, when, when you felt this revelation and this aha shift mm-hmm. in your mindset, and then you just shifted gears and moved forward into the man that you are today. Yeah, I think it happened to me when I was actually starting off high school. So I, before starting off high school, I really wanted to go into a school where I can hit that restart button. And I wanted to hit that restart button for many, for many reasons. One of them is that I truly believe that the way I was viewed in high school was not the person that I was at heart. And so when I went into high school and I really kind of began this new journey, now some of the behaviors and things like that still translated over because it's not one of those, it's not a flip of a switch and it's not exactly you get out of bed one morning and it's like all those new old behavior drop. You have to work on them constantly. And the way to do it is you have to, you have to look for other people who are practicing healthy behaviors, healthy patterns. Right, you got to surround yourself thoughts. with the right people. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. And so for me, I was really looking for those people. And then I think probably right when I went to college, that's when I made even a bigger shift and started to step into this person. But to take it even a step farther, the reason why I do what I do today is because of a question I had asked myself, I think it was four to five years after being adopted. And the question was, why me? Why was I put through all the challenges? Why was I the one that had faced everything during the first 12 years? And for the longest time, I used to think that that answer has to come in this like dramatic fashion. But really, the answer was always within me. If not you, then who else? Yeah, but and that but, but that built you that built that fortitude and that tenacity to really be who you are. I mean, you would not be. Mm-hmm. It's so crazy. Like obviously, in the moment, right when you're in an orphanage and you're getting beat down by the older kids, you're not thinking about being at the age of 24 where you are now. Like you're not thinking about that shit. Yeah. But when you look back on it now, would you have had it any other way? No. I you know I think this is I think this is the only way it's meant to be so because everything led me to who I am today, all those experiences, all the events. And so I I learned, that's why, that's why I was telling you earlier, embracing the whole journey and really just acknowledging yourself and choosing to love yourself, but also Mm -hmm. be proud of all the things that happened to us. Not only the good moments, because it's even what I've learned is that the biggest and the best teachers are actually those that happened during times of adversity. When you're literally put in a position and you're forced to decide left or right or some other way, that's the best. That's it, man. Exactly. That's the best teacher you're going to get. It's the, the analogy I give. It's when you're at your lowest that you really see your true self and you see what you're made of. When you're having those hard times and you got to make those tough decisions, that's incredible. So let's shift a little bit more positive mm-hmm. direction now mm-hmm. um what are you up to now what do you what do you what do you what do you do for the world what do you give mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what do i give for the world so what i started was an organization two years ago that has really just become a part of my life and who i am and that is overcoming odds and what it's been is really just a space for people to be able to be heard valued and supported through commu- a community of individuals who have faced similar circumstances in their lives. And so when I begin to understand that and really learn that from kind of one person to another, that's where I found so much joy within life and happiness and Love it. connections and opportunities to even connect with people like you who believe in the same thing that I think we're always one connection away from making any of the dreams that we envision possible. And so as long as, exactly. As long as I continue to believe that, that we're always just one connection away. And that's, that's all I need to know. Yeah. And, and we put that into practice, man. We were talking about it before, you know, Ola came to me and he said, Hey, there's, you know, four or five people on my, on my list, my dream list. Could you help mm-hmm. me connect with anyone? I said, listen, man, I personally can't do that, but I know somebody who may be able to help you. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's that mindset. It's that, that karmatic pay it forward 
mm -hmm. know, thinking about the next person, which is really aligns, uh, you know, everyone together and keeps us connected. Mm -hmm. Oleg, tell us a little bit about the podcast. So the podcast started a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And what it's really been is once again, a space for people to be able to share their stories and their unique experiences. What I'm a huge believer is that I don't, I don't believe in building platforms for only one specific group. So when I was listening to different plot podcasts a couple of years ago, I noticed that a lot of the guests were celebrity profile guests. Mm -hmm. And then I started to look at that and I said, well, what about everyday people like me? Does that mean that I don't have any value to add to this world? Can I not have any impact? So I started to create that space for everyday people because I firmly believe that if you have a conversation long enough with an individual, not only can you find ways to support each other, but you can also find value within one another. And one of the biggest things that I've recently come across, which I believe is a huge underlying message behind this podcast and this message to begin with, is that it was, there was a quote that I came across from one of the people that, <coughs> that I connected on LinkedIn with. And she was saying, something along the lines of everyone we meet knows something we don't. And the reason why I bring that up is because the people that we interview on the show have value. They have perspectives to share and they may not be celebrities. They may not be famous actors. They may be just working people that go from nine to five or whatever the profession may be. But each and every single one of them has tremendous wisdom to share if you give them the time and the space to be able to process and really share that experience with others. Yeah. Pause it on that for a moment. That's, that's killer, man. I love it. Oleg, let's bring it home here. What does the word mm -hmm. authenticity mean to you? What does it mean to be authentic? What does it mean to be authentic? To me, authenticity means living from your heart. And so what, the reason why I say that is because Ironically enough, I was actually on a flight from Philadelphia to Austin about two years ago. And it was a flight that I purchased through Frontier Airlines. It's about $34. And as part of that journey, it, was, it left at 6 a.m. in the morning. Remember, I got on the plane. One of the first things I heard was a baby crying on board. And in my mind, I was probably thinking, who's going to be that lucky passenger? I turned out to be the lucky passenger sitting next to that baby for the whole flight, got in my seat, pulled out my phone and started to write down different things that I think identified with me and my story. And one of those first words was actually authenticity. And I started to break it down what I thought it meant to be authentic for me. So I broke it down letter by letter. So to give you an example, A was accepting your past. Um, you was understanding you are unique. So I broke down each one of them. And then from that first draft, I understood that that's who I was at heart. And that's who I am when I believe, I believe that's who I am when I connect with other people. That's how I show up to other people. That's how I show up in this world. I, I have nothing to hide. All it is, is just opportunities to grow. So for me, when I choose to share, I don't go 75% or 80%. I go 100% all the time because it just puts me in opportunities where I can grow from those moments. It gives me chances to dig deeper in topics that I've never thought of before. So when people oftentimes ask me a question and they'll say, Hey, if it's too personal, you know, don't feel like you have to answer it. And I actually choose that to look at that as a challenge. Yeah. You know, for me, it's like, nothing's too personal. Like whatever you ask, you do, you, it's man. all part of this life. I fucking love you know? it, man. No, it's great. And what happened with that? Did the baby cry the whole flight? The baby cried the whole flight. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was funny oh, because babies. the mom, the mom had a, uh, she looked at me and she said, Hey, I'm so sorry that, you know, this is happening. But honestly, thanks to her and the baby for crying and keeping me up for three to four hours of that flight, because it is due to that experience that I've been able to travel around the country and speak to different campuses and organizations on the same exact concept that literally came from that flight. True story. Yeah. Had it not been for that uh, flight. It's inspiration, man. That's how shit yeah. happens. That's it's those sparks of inspiration, man. 
I love to ask, you know, and, I, and I mentioned on your show, like I, there, there's mm-hmm. a couple of questions that at the end of my show that I love to ask every guest because I love to get the perspectives on it. And mm-hmm. one that I really love is, what is the single greatest piece of advice that you've ever received that you take action on daily? Mm-hmm. Well, that piece of advice comes from my dad. When I was in sixth grade and I had asked him for help with my homework, I came up to him. He was sitting at the dinner table and I said, hey, dad, could you help me solve this math problem? Really, what I, was, what I was asking from him was that, hey, dad, could you solve this math problem for me? I was a teenager. I was just trying to get breeze through that math packet so I can move on and go play with my friends. Instead of doing the problem for me, he pulled up a chair, took out a white sheet of paper, and he said, we can solve this together. And it was during that time he had said a phrase and a, or a message that has stuck with me and literally has become a principle of who I am. And that is son. Never say you can't do something in life. Those words are the exact words that I live my life by every single day. I firmly believe that there's no obstacle, that there's no challenge too great to overcome. There is always a way as long as there's a will. I firm, full heartedly believe that. Love it. Sometimes it doesn't come in the shape and the size and the way that we envision it, but that's not the point. The point of it all is not to know the how. The point of it all is nowhere to start. Yeah, dude. What's your superpower? What do you what do you do better that makes you who you are, man? That makes Oleg Oleg. What is my superpower? I truly believe. Besides my... having superhero hair, you got great head of hair, man. <laughs> my superpower is my you got the ability. Thor hair. Yeah, my my superpower is definitely my hair. No, but my superpower, I firmly believe, is my ability to connect with people. And I think the reason why is because I've come to a point in my life where I truly don't judge based on appearances, based on who you are. I give you the same space and the same time that any other person receives every time I encounter them. And the reason why I do that is I'm a firm believer that we all have value to add. Every single one of us. People, have diff- people travel different paths in this life. So the path that you took to wherever you are is probably not the path that I took to where I am am today. So that's really who I am at heart is just someone who's able to connect with other people. And I think the reason why is because I firmly believe in myself and I think other people can see that and they're able to believe in themselves ultimately. I love it. And and last, but certainly not least, right? Like in Mm -hmm. your dark times, right? When you were in that orphanage, when you were in, some really dark fucking places, man. And you Mm -hmm. look up and you needed to find that light to pull you forward, you know, and on the opposite of that, like where you are now, when you want to show extreme gratitude Mm -hmm. and thankful for this family and life that you have. Oh, like what is your North star? My North star is me. My North star is me is because I know for a fact that no matter what happens, I'm still going to continue believing in myself I firmly believe that whatever the obstacle, whatever the challenge may be in front of me, that I can find a way to work through it. And I firmly believe that I have what it takes to become the person that I envision that I dream of every single day. So that North Star is always with me. It's always within me. And because of it, it also helps me understand that, like you said earlier, there's no course that I have to purchase. There's no podcast that I have to wait for to come out in 10 years. It's always here. It's always available at any given time. So for me, it's really just choosing to step into it and utilizing it to the best of its ability. Yeah, man. Dude, I, I applaud you for who you are, your vulnerability, your openness, your energy, and your generosity, man. And I'm so happy and thrilled that the universe brought us together. Uh, Mm -hmm. I look forward to developing our friendship, our relationship, and uh, finding synergies together. Oleg, where can people find you? Where can they connect with you? Mm -hmm. The best way that people can find us and connect with us is through our website, and that is overcomingdowns.today, or people can connect with me individually like you and I have through LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, any of those platforms. I'm open to connecting with anyone, and I'm particularly looking to connect with people who are developing different communities or looking to develop communities and elevate some of these voices of people and specifically groups 
that have been uh, marginalized in today's day and age. Awesome, man. I appreciate you. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for having thank me on the show and giving me this opportunity to share my story. I, like I told you earlier, I think what you are doing, it truly is extremely beneficial to people like me, not only for the opportunity to spread the message about what we're doing, but this is a constant reminder of the fact that my story does have value and that the fact that I can connect with others wherever they are along their path. It's through platforms like this one. 100% man. Thank you. That's a wrap, man. And to everyone listening, thank you again for joining us on the podcast. Please be sure to follow us on all the social media channels. We're going to link it below. Click link, subscribe, share it. Remember, most importantly, what Oleg and I are doing right now, what we have been doing, we're taking our online, offline, connect to real people. People are fascinating and, and have those conversations. And catch us next week for another great episode of the podcast. Take care, everybody. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode jam-packed with more incredible humans. For more info, please visit www.nhptalentgroup.com.